Friends, how are you doing? One sec. Well, I've got a lot of questions. A lot of questions coming in. Good to see you all again. Hope you're well. I'm just going to kick straight into these questions because there's a lot of good ones. Um, I'm really pleased, by the way, that that this is of use and of service. And and some of the questions like come up a bit repeatedly, so I'm gonna answer them. And, and the disclaimer is that the answers might be different from week to week, but that doesn't mean, like some of the questions are quite open-ended. So I hope that doesn't, you, you like you all don't think, well, he said one thing one week and one thing the next. I mean, hopefully like the specific things are always the specific. They're the things that I believe, but the other thing to say is that obviously this is just my, my sort of thoughts at the the present moment when I'm when I'm I'm thinking of these these answers. So yeah, it's not like I really encourage you to to get like a balanced opinion and and to like do loads of research and stuff. But I'm giving you like my honest honest answers to this stuff, and I'm loving answering the questions. And and like long may Tuesday nights at six o'clock continue because because I think it's a vibe and. And um, if it's helping, which I think it is, because I'm getting lots of positive feedback, thank you for all your DMs and, and messages and everything else. Um, shout out to Jasmine, who is helping me, and Josh. Um, they're just collecting the questions and then sending them through on my text. But I've got, like, loads from um, the week, so let's just crack in. Crack in. What do you recommend for artists to get noticed today? Keep releasing or wait for gigs. I guess the waiting for gigs kind of thing is maybe a bit depressing. So, because who knows when those gigs are going to be coming coming back? Although, like virtual gigs, I guess you can you could do in IG lives like this and just just do some stuff. So I guess that's a positive way of doing stuff. But I, I think releasing and and putting stuff out there is is the best way. I think it's like the best medicine for for all of us creatives to to keep moving like even whether you're putting stuff up or not I think just to keep the daily feeling that you're doing something that you've achieved something by the end of the day is just is really important especially in lockdown because I think that we can all get pretty low and, and think like you know what's the future of of live music or or you know how are our careers going but I think that to be able to feel that you've each day like achieved something is 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 really good so I, th I feel that you can yeah to keep putting music out and keep keep setting goals and and put a goal for however much stuff you want to put out in in or write in a week or um a month or the next three months i, th I think it's really positive like goals and, and write them down and keep keep looking at your goals and keep keep smashing it keep doing it Thoughts on ten years since Twenty One was released? Yeah, that that's a long time. But I tell you what, people say um, people say that life is short, but I think life is long. Like if you if you pack a lot of things in, because I was talking to Sarah, my wife, about this, and just thinking, in some ways it does feel like yesterday, but in in some ways that ten years since, because I remember back to to being in my studio in Fulham and. And writing that with Adele and that being an amazing, incredible moment of, of when she went into the vocal booth and, and recorded the vocals. And I don't know if I've said this before, um, but there was that, that moment where you, I was looking at the, my engineer at the time, Beatrice Artola, and we were like just gobsmacked, obviously at Adele's vocal, but just how emotional and and just how she just embodied that that song and when the chorus came and then it just kept going up and up and up and when she came to the last chorus that like that ad lib that she did just took it over the edge i'd never she hadn't sung that before and she sang it in the booth and it was just those moments that you you'll never forget i'll obviously never forget in in, in my life but the thoughts on on the 10 years i mean the, the thing is with that i think when when any song is released that 
that does so well. It just opens so many doors and it gives you so much confidence. It gave me so much confidence that that I could mix a track that would that would go to number one in America and that, that would, you know, just out of this little studio that wasn't wasn't anything incredible you know it was a, it, it was lovely to me but it wasn't wasn't like it was mixed in some kind of grand place or and the song yeah will will sort of live on and i think that that gave me a lot of confidence to to do lots of things and 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 it's really important for me to say that because a lot of people write in about learning piano and and all that kind of thing like i'm not a great piano player but i played the piano on that set fast to the rain and and I hear it today and it sounds good and it wasn't overly edited, but it, it does show you what you can do. Like I'm, I've never had like piano lessons or anything. So it's kind of simple, but maybe one day I was thinking of ways that I could actually, um, <laughs> sounds weird, but, but like put my, put like a, my a camera on like a headband so I can go and go around and just be like playing stuff and show you guys like the piano that I played so far to the rain on and just play it and show you how well, it kind of maybe it sounds simple i don't know but but just like play it on the piano i thought that would be cool one week but i'll, I'll keep thinking of that try and find the headband for the for the camera to go on but um yeah it's been an incredible 10 years and and thing for me is um just the gratitude of 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 that moment um of 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 having that opportunity of of working with adele and i think there was another question about adele how did you get the opportunity to work with adele and how did you build how do you build the relationship with the artist um well the opportunity was through i guess the stuff that i've been doing but um a song i guess i, I was trying to work it out i mean i've never asked adele but um i was doing stuff at the time with tinchy strider that had, that had gone well in the charts and tired Cruz, but it was also a song with james morrison that I co-wrote with Nina Woodford and, and James Morrison called Broken Strings. Um, and that did really well as well. So I guess artists like Adele, you know, they've, they've always got their, their eye on, on who's doing stuff that's, that's, that's reacting out there. So she came in and, and suggested that we did like a week together and we wrote, wrote three songs of which Set Fire to the Rain was was the one that she wanted to use. And just looking at the question again to make sure I'm answering it. Um, so, so yeah, she, I think she, she checked me out and then, then wanted to come in. That was what I was going to say. The interesting thing was that, what was the, the thing about luck is when opportunity meets hard work. But I think that's the thing. Um, but the interesting thing to say is that that I worked on a record for a year, pretty much before Adele came in. Oops, sorry, my charger. Um, before Adele came in, and and it had kind of gone nowhere. Like it, it, it. There was a lot of hype around this particular artist who was brilliant, and and had worked for a year, and and actually been like that was the the preparation, and that was the hard work, maybe for the opportunity of of Adele to come in. And I remember spending a year with this artist that that I loved and it was kind of piano based and very very singer songwritery kind of stuff with like big tribal drums and and the record came out and it was a bit of a disappointment and I think the the artist um lost faith in in what was going on and and maybe with the record company and and actually with me because she maybe thought it was it was because of the music, which it may have been. I take that responsibility, but but I remember feeling crushed and thinking, "Wow, I've just given like a year of my life to this artist, and what's come out of it?" You know, it's it's like it's I spent all the time and and poured my heart into this record, but but it's gone nowhere. And the interesting thing is, when I look back, is that that was all that preparation. I think for Adele walking in, because at that point, like I. I felt like very fluid on the piano and we'd worked out how to record live drums really well in the studio and just done all this kind of really hard work that, that paid off in, in the moment that Adele turned up. So, so it's interesting, like as a, as a, as a thing that I would want to pass on to everybody, it's not necessarily the, 
the moments that you where where you you smash it and where you think wow that was just moments don't come out of anywhere you know they 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 definitely come from somewhere where you've you you've applied yourself in terms of like you may have written a hundred songs and then just get into to a songwriting session with one person and then that thing reacts and you think wow that was amazing we wrote that song in six hours but you only were able to write it because of the work that you'd done before or the the keyboard skills that you'd learned or the the lyrics producing like all those different things that all the hours that you put in I think are logged on the clock it's like anything it's like a footballer taking penalties you, you, there must just be like millions of of balls that 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 footballers must hit to get to that point where where the opportunity meets meets all the hard work and then people say I was lucky that it went in but but it's actually not because of the 5,000 footballs that the the striker put in or the hundreds of miles that thousands of miles that the runner ran or the the millions of songs that we all write so so yeah that's a that's a, a good example of that um without any industry links what does one need to become a successful songwriter um yeah we did we did talk about this but i guess every time i'm asked the question there might be a slightly different thought i mean the first thing is that that industry links are important but but i i i didn't have any industry links at all when i was coming through um and and there were less, I guess, less opportunities. Again, I don't want this to sound like some kind of sub story because it's not. But there were less opportunities before the internet and before before things like Songlink and and these different things, which I had never heard of. But I'm just hearing from from people that are um, messaging me. Um, so, like, I I know it could feel maybe hopeless, you know, when you're writing songs in your room or you, you you're coming up with stuff like, how do I get this out? But I think that just on Instagram or on, on similar like social networking sites, you know, you can put stuff up and, and I, honestly, the cream will rise because someone once said to me something that they said, there's so much good out there, but there's so little great. And I think that if, if you're, you're sort of MO, your mission is to, is to chase greatness, then it, honestly it's it's going to happen I, I i don't think there's any trick to to working with great artists or or putting out great stuff i honestly and it's it, maybe if anyone was being cynical you'd think well you know you're sat there and you you know work with all these great artists but i think that if if, if your stuff is truly great you're always going to succeed whether you have industry contacts or not you know and then and then you succeed and then it's more about navigating your career into doing the things that you want to do and saying no to things that you think could be good in the short term and and just keeping chasing greatness and and evaluating your career in a way that that is very honest and and true so so what does one need to become a successful songwriter i think i think you need the determination but you also need the this is actually going into someone else's question but i mean rule here so um there was someone that that tested me texted me that or messaged me that that had been in a situation that didn't work out very well and and was felt like financially burned by the situation and and i think that at that point i guess it's like reconnecting with the joy of of what it is we do like the simplicity of of sitting at the piano and coming up with a chord or singing a melody or, or writing down a lyric, like without any of the pressure of, 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 of your own expectation of, of getting a deal or, or writing a song with Adele or, or any of those things. And I think that, that it's, it's, it's really important to manage that because the further, well, it's important to manage it in the first instance so you can keep going, but then you have to manage it as you become more successful because the voice in your head would be saying, but why are you, why are you not working with so-and-so? Why are you not doing this? Or why, why is there just one Grammy on the thing? Why is there not, not 10? And I'm sure when there's 10, Beyonce probably thinks, why do I not have, well, I think she does have 50, doesn't she? But like 60 or 70, 
you know, the, the it's a never ending thing. So I guess like reconnecting with the joy of, of what you, like the childlike joy of, of playing the guitar and the, the, the things that will connect you with music, which is usually stuff which is for free and non ego based and, and just very pure. I think that that's the key because you do need to be resilient. But I guess if you if you feel sort of comfortable in your your small space, albeit like like a tiny bedroom that you you have like a phone to record your ideas and and a notepad to write stuff down on maybe a laptop that you can record some stuff or or not like then that that should be enough. And then I think if you take that and perfect that, then it will it the quality will expand and and if you're, you you will eventually be able to yeah you'll put stuff up and people will react to it if it's coming from that from that great place i mean i remember when i first met craig david and and he met he made that incredible first record born to do it in in like very basic studio without much equipment that record still sounds great today and it's sold like i don't know like 10 million copies um so i think that that the, the, the sort of bringing back the sort of humility because I think the problem is we we're all on social media and it's easy to see everyone else like having a great time and living their best life and and doing this and doing that and feeling like they're really inspired in the studio and doing all these different things the reality is you know it, it, we are kind of in the trenches a lot of the time like struggling to find that that inspiration and that but I think so much of it is mindset and I've learned over the years that that it's about just going in and showing up and and every day, like I said at the very beginning of this, like just doing something however small, just coming up with a beat or or a chord, a new chord, and just exploring some some kind of musical things that you want to explore, or 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 just just writing out a list of things that you got to do for the day, and just being able to cross them off, I think is super positive, and that builds momentum, which over the course of a career will will really help because it's not about like chasing that one Grammy moment and then like everything else for it. To me, it's about maintaining this kind of level career that hopefully goes up over time, which it, I guess it will with experience and, and, um, and the opportunities that you'll be given. Um, but it's just keeping going. I want to keep going till I'm, till I'm, till I'm dead basically. So, so I think that's like a healthy, healthy goal and when you you look at the space of the career thinking back to the 10 years thing like life is long there's a there's a there's a long time to do stuff and, and like some of the messages that I was getting were were is it too late and I would say like it's never too late because because I think I had my first number one in when I was 37 or 38 or something and I feel like my career started like a long time before that but I have like reincarnations of careers from from like pub singer to like terrible wedding singer to to pretty bad producer to like better producer to better songwriter to all that all these different things over the course so I think there is there is time um top three favorite plugins okay so like I know there's a lot of producers and um and people that are like okay with this but for anyone that that doesn't know what a plugin is it's a like a virtual effect that that you would get in a computer so you you get that when when we're in the these programs like garage band or logic or or ableton or pro tools you have these things that you put on the sound to change the sound like a compressor or a um a chorus or reverb or or all manner of things and and usually us producers like have many of these things because they're they're so incredible my favorite ones are in no particular order and there's so many so this is a really hard question to answer but auto filter on ableton i just love the way that that sounds and i use it all the time ozone 9 because i think that's an incredible plugin for like mastering and mixing um valhalla vintage verb I have that on pretty much everything and oak sound i think it's like the sound soothe which i really like for eqing the mid-range that, that got pretty geeky but um hope that helps um 
advice for long rap storytelling beats how do you keep it engaging i think um like on a track like leslie i i i think we touched on this last week um for me like where rap songs get 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 very long and you you're straying out of like the verse chorus kind of bridge chorus um format for me like i treated and i think dave treated as well like leslie like a like a story so for me it was like a little a mini feature film like a like an epic song but like a, a small film so i really wanted to get in, inside the lyrics and i just listened to it over and over again like the acapella and then once i'd i'd got where the kind of scenes were in the song i felt that i could approach it musically and it and i did approach it like a film so i played it and i had some strings on the keys and i would just put the 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 um, Pro Tools into record and literally heard it and was playing along. I can't even remember whether it was to a click, maybe, but that doesn't matter. But but um, I was playing strings to it and just was was really feeling the the Dave's vocal on that. So I think that then that that becomes it's basically like a jam session. And then I've I've seen um, I've seen videos of 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 various string composers and i think that that's the way that they do it i don't know because i'm not an expert but i think that they string composers do that when they've got the pictures in front of them they have like the video screen and, and they'll do that so i guess that's the that's a, a tip that's what i did anyway and hope that helps with long storytelling rap uh what's what's the best studio you've ever worked in okay like um two multiple answers to this just because it would be hard to say one i guess if you're if you're someone that's that's been working at like a major studio for all their life then i guess it would obviously be that but i'm lucky enough to have my own studios all over the place and i think like firstly always my t like my studio at my parents house or my studio my 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 bedroom was where i came up with with so much stuff like every studio i've had i've, I've been I've had this connection because I've always made music that that I've I've not loved but I've that that I've been really connected with at every studio. I mean, the studio I'm in now, I'd say is is like my my absolute like utopia. I'm 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 so happy here and I'm so grateful to have this studio. It's again, I'll show you it at some point, but I've got all my synths set up and I've got live drums and I've got a piano and and it's just like an incredible incredibly creative place to be but every studio along the way that where i've had studios and kind of like run down printing works or like i said students um in my my parents house or, or in, in, in when i was like a student at all, all those places but in terms of like the big ones um again it's more down to the stuff that i've done there and and I would say that the difference between the big studios that we all see is that they can sometimes also be cold because they haven't really got your stuff. What I love about my studio is that it's got all my, it's like, it's kind of like a, it's very much me, you know, it's got all my guitars, it's got all my synths, all the, all the things that I love down to, you know, anyone that comes here, I, you know, I want them to, to, to feel relaxed, feel, feel comfortable and, and enjoy the vibe. So, so everything's set up for that, you know, so um so big studios yeah can be cold but uh, it, having said that the, the studios like air adele where where we've recorded so much stuff in london uh metropolis um rack studios capital studios in la abbey road um conway studios in la i've been really lucky to to have gone to and worked at some of these like incredible places where you feel like the history where people will say you know this is where they were like james taylor recorded or or this is where the, the weekend recorded and and you're just like so inspired to be there's something about the energy of those big places where you feel you know or like rack where where you'd go and 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 you just so many records have been 
recorded there over the years that you sort of feel this this sort of heritage it's like stepping into a castle or something where 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 you know there's been kind of kings and queens have lived there and you just feel you feel sort of humbled by it so yeah i can't say one but um what advice would you give someone starting to learn to play piano by ear good question um i think i mean I learned piano by ear when I was very, very young, and like I was not a prodigy or or any kind of child that was playing Mozart when they were five or whatever. But I just remember going over to the piano at my my nan's house, um, and just it, just losing myself in it and just enjoying the the relationship between the notes. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I think if you're playing by ear, it, it's important to get a real feel of of just like the it sounds weird, but just the the tonality of of some of the notes and how the relationship between like intervals on the on the keys and just coming up with your own chords and just hearing just just playing those chords and letting them sit and then moving it down an octave and moving it up two octaves and just just seeing how that how that sounds to you and then I guess hearing stuff playing stuff back on your phone and and seeing if you can pick out the notes. That will really help. I used to do that on guitar all the time. I'd learn Jimi Hendrix solos and all that kind of stuff. And and that is really good for your ear to to be able to hear different chords and, and different different melody notes in in solos. So yeah, I would would it's the empathy with the instrument really. And the more you can develop that then then the better that's gonna come. And that that's the only thing that stopped me really from learning music in that were two things one that that I wanted to make sure that I always had this sort of deep hidden fear of if I could read music that it might take something away from the from the empathy of it which actually I don't think it does but I I do think the empathy comes first I see people that can read music sometimes very well but but the the way to read music is is not to interpret it and I think that if you're playing by ear you're naturally always interpreting music and that's why like I'm still a terrible sight reader and I've spent hours trying to learn sight reading but I just I I just want to do it for the challenge and and to open up like all these great composers works to me so I can read stuff and then work it out but um yeah um empathy with the with the instrument I think is key um favorite sample library so sample packs um Again, for people that are not producers, um, just where you, where you can go and get sounds, and there's some great resources there with companies like Splice. And I used to to, to get like sample CDs um, where you, they come and it's full of sounds. There's so many good people out there making sample libraries, but I've become friends with the guy called Jay who who makes a sample library called Capson, and I think that they're really great. I think that. There were some really old school ones that that I sometimes come back to, like Abstract Hip Hop, which is a really old one in the nineties, which I think was great. Um, I think the thing is with sample libraries is I've never really had one where I've just rinsed the whole the whole library. I think the thing for me is just, is you can get an idea, and because I play, I would mainly the music would would usually come and I'm, you know there might be a, a kick drum or a snare here and there that I would maybe add to something of my own but I think the thing is to say is that those things are like great starting points and then to like expand into your own because I think nowadays you can get those sample packs and sort of make whole songs with that which is obviously cool if that's what you want to do but but I think it's more exciting to maybe just take those things and maybe reverse a sample or chop it up or just just have have fun with it but yeah caps and stuff is is really good um how did children of the internet come about and what was it like working with dave well working with dave is is always incredible because he's like a genius and he always pushes i guess everyone that he works with definitely pushes me because he's so on top of his game all the time and great guy and and unpredictable like any I guess like any true great artist. So 
that was an incredible time working on 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 the EPs and on psychodrama absolutely unforgettable and so brilliant to feel that that myself Dave and Manon and Jack and Benny you know were, were just working together with a small team creating something that 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 became so successful so like absolute you know nothing but like great feelings and gratitude looking back on those those times um children of the internet came about where dave always comes up with brilliant titles and he had the title children of the internet so i thought that would be a great song for us to write so so we started writing it and it had like some different forms um and we, we'd never really settled on it and and then it came to writing my album and and i really wanted to use it so i changed the music completely and sent it back to dave with his verses on it and and it just was that it fitted really well in with the the 12 questions with the question why are we divided when we're when we're so connected and then that that became like this answer to to where dave was was talking obviously about about like sometimes the perils of getting too too hooked on on the internet and and yeah came up with this i came up with this sort of haunting melody and and chords that that dave liked and and yeah the the rest is history i guess on that on that track um what's another one uh oh struggling to find a way back in trying to find the passion i think we've done that um let me just check these text messages Um, who's your go-to mix engineer and why? That's a good one. Um, initially, initially I learned to mix and I found it a real challenge and, and very, um, powerful to, to do my own mixes. So the, I'm trying to think like on the, on the really early stuff. I was mixing with an engineer out of Soho Studios, Joe, on a lot of the early stuff, but it was, it, he did some, some great stuff, but I was just really interested in, in mixing. And I think like I just felt like powerful being able, being able to mix. So, so the Tinchy stuff, a lot of the Kano stuff, the, 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 Adele and yeah from that point where I could mix I, I was mixing a lot but then I started working with Manon Grandjean who is an incredible engineer and, and an incredible mix engineer and we started mixing together and now she's doing her own mixes and I mentioned to her the, the other week to see whether she would want to come on here and like if we had like a loads of kind of mixing questions whether she would she would be up for answering those questions because she's incredible mix engineer in her own right now and, and doing some amazing things that sort of just just mix the fredo record which i'm looking forward to checking out um but i've also had the opportunity of working with with someone like the the big names like spike stent and phil tan and wes clark and and all those guys are amazing tom elmhurst um everyone does does their thing differently so so again not like a, a simple question to it to answer but I guess there's people that do certain things well as well so maybe there isn't like one mix engineer of course Manny Marroquin um Andrew Sheps god the, the list the list goes on but different people do do great things in different realms of some guys that seem to do so many things differently but um you know like across genre but yeah, I think if you can develop your own mixing as well, I think that's that's really strong because then at least if you were to get someone else to mix your track, then you've got a point of view and you can come in and just say, well, how about adding, you know, could could you add a little bit of 63 hertz on the kick or, you know, you, you can be very specific and get get to where you need to be super quickly. So it's definitely a good, if you're a producer, a, a definitely a good investment of time with that. Um, is Universal Audio's gear worth the price? Yeah, I think it is. I've 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 got a lot of it and and I really think those guys those guys are great. Um 
Simple answer, I guess, for once. Um, what software do you use? I use Ableton, um, Ableton Live, Pro Tools, and a bit of Logic, and the Sony Fossil to get ideas. I think I showed you this last week, but the ancient tape recorder. I don't know why I did that, just because I feel cool being like retro and analog. Um, wh what song do you, ri do you wish you'd written yourself? Um, wow. Um, uh, You've Got a Friend by, now was that Carol King or James Taylor? Because I know they were married, but what a great song. I mean, there's, there's loads. I'm being flippant, but I mean, that's a great one. I, I wish I'd written cat, like millions of songs. Um, Kids, MGMT, Paranoid Android, Creep, Radiohead, um, so many, so many. There's so much inspiration out there, but um, but I love Carol King. What motivated you to pursue music? That's a good one. Um, motivation, I guess, just the love of it. I, I, there was nothing else that I loved as much. I could lose myself in in sort of time which I guess is a sign of something being great um felt like to me it was this personal connection between between music I mean it's it's such a incredible blessing to have that to have anything that you do where you you can make a living and you know people say oh you're lucky you know to be doing this and I absolutely say that I mean it is hard work but but I'm there's not a day that goes by that I'm not grateful so the pursuit I guess the pursuit of happiness, we're all trying to be happy and we're all trying to be fulfilled and, and to leave some sort of legacy on this earth for when, when we're not there, for some, some beats or a lyric or a, a piano or a, a guitar riff that, that, that people are going to jam to when, when like we're not here anymore. So yeah, it's that pursuit. And, and I guess that that, that was, I just followed that to the exclusion of everything else and, and did pretty terribly at school and sort of left myself with no other option, which I guess was uh, scary, kind of for my parents. But I, I just knew that whatever I was going to do, music was making me happy. So whether whatever job I was going to do in music, it was, it was always going to be good. And I mean, things have turned out really well through luck, hard work, perseverance, but but... Yeah, the pursuit of, of of happiness, I guess, and and, and connection. Um, was being signed to a publisher more important than being signed to a manager or vice versa? Um, good one. Let me just think about that. I'll have a quick sip of water. Um, I think a manager can get you a publishing deal, but I think if you get the wrong manager, then that can do more harm than good. I think if you, the, the, the idea I guess is just, is, is having some people that are, that, are, that are in your team that are, are fighting for you and that are, are champions. You know, I, I have so many champions along the way that, that, that were there. Like my first publisher, Kate Sweetser, Actually, she was my second publisher, but um, the first publisher was, was Strong Songs, and they were great. And then Kate Sweetser at, at Chrysalis at the time was a huge supporter of me and my music and really fought for, for me and, and would would call people persistently and, and never give up. And I think that was a massive help and eternally grateful to her. But people along the way have, have, have been there knocking down knocking on the doors and I think that you know you feel humble when people are willing to do that for you but whether it's a manager or a publisher I kind of want to say it doesn't matter as long as as long as there is someone there that that you trust and is is able to do that for you and I do think there's power in that because as artists you know we you know I still don't like cold calling people I, I still don't like kind of asking people for favors or or asking people i think i think you have to have a certain type of character that i really admire if if people have that 
but I, I'm, I'm kind of still, which sounds ridiculous at, at, at my age, but I'm still kind of shy about my work, you know, and it sounds weird because a, a lot of my work can be confident, but, but I'm not so, like the confidence is in the music, but in, in terms of like banging down doors, I, I still rely and I love having like my management and, and the people that help me to do that and, and my publishers to, to, to bring opportunities. So, so whether it's a manager or publisher, I think, I think ideally both, but, but if, if you had one, it, it, it's, it's choosing that person that, that is really gonna, gonna believe in you, for you. Writing the best song, writing the best song you can is one thing, but how do you get into the studio with the right artist? Good point. Um, getting into the studio with the right artist, you, you've got to kiss, kiss a lot of frogs. I mean, well, that sounds a bit mean. I didn't mean that to sound sound like that. But I mean, you you have it. I guess it's like a relationship. You have to you have to sometimes at the beginning, like speed date. You have to you have to have a longer relationship. You have to maybe write a few songs. You you you'll know when it's the right artist because the the music will click and you you'll have that understanding of each other. Um, but I guess that's when you've got them in. But how do you find the right artist? I guess you've. I guess it's easier to knock on doors when when you're DMing people. I mean, lots of people DM me, and that's cool. I think if you if you found a new artist that you like, DM them and and see if they get back to you, and and send them a SoundCloud link or a a link of your music. And I'm sure that if the music's good enough and the 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 person that the artist um, is into your music, then they'll they'll reach out. But I guess then at that point you've you still got to go through the the thing where they mo- may not like you or may there may be something off or whatever you just have to you just have to keep going i think with with co-writing and and not be disheartened because it's not it's it's not personal you know any any of the stuff so so to find the right artist i mean one of these days i'll i'll count up the amount of songs that i've actually written because i've i've got pretty much all of them logged but it's definitely in the thousands. And I mean, the songs that, that you would have heard are in the, probably in the tens. So it shows you how many songs I've written that, that haven't maybe been with the right artist or weren't the right songs or wasn't the right day or the artist wasn't into me or I wasn't particularly connected with the artist. So I don't want it to sound like it's, you have to go through so many people, but I mean, I think at the beginning, it's, it, it's good to do that because it, also you're learning. So, you know, there's that 10,000 hour rule where you sort of hit a, a point where you're, you, you get to be really good after 10,000 hours, which I've worked out is about five years of like eight hours a day, which is quite a long, quite a long time. But as long as the process is fun, then that's what matters. Um, what's your opinion on songwriters getting points on masters? Um... Good question. Songwriters getting points on masters. I think like every every case is different. Not to sound like I'm sitting on the fence, but but I think the songwriters need to be rewarded. I, th- I think there's a there's a a disparity between sometimes between producers the recording the recorded work and the the song and I. I, I really sympathise with, with lots of songwriters that, that don't produce, you know, the, the true sort of pure songwriters that, that are seeing huge songs come out and maybe doing really well on Spotify and, and, and Apple Music and the streaming services and maybe not, not feeling like they've, they've been rewarded in the way that they should be. So I think there should be really a, a, a review of of the way that the business works to make sure that everyone is is safeguarded i think that the ppl for example coming in for musicians was one of the the best things ever because it well it had actually been a, a, around a long time but um the fact that now musicians that that have played on great 
big big songs and now being able to to have residual income is really important as well i just for me everyone needs to be looked after and and from from the the engineers which to be fair if 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 they're doing the right deals will be but yeah musicians and and songwriters so yeah long-winded answer but but um i do think people should be looked after um what are you listening to at the moment i i don't want this to sound like a plug because it's it, it's honestly not i don't want these instagram lives to be like about me promoting anything it absolutely not but um we've just put a a playlist together on spotify on the future utopia um uh page on spotify which is all the stuff i'm listening to so it's it's all there it's called ocean full of fishes and it's like 20 tracks or so that i've been listening to that i'm i'm really into at the minute um are you still tracking through that beautiful uta console yes i am can you see it it's there somewhere i mean it's massive can't really miss it there it is in the background yeah beautiful um it's it was designed by my friend eric valentine who is an absolute genius and i've got so much of his gear and we well he designed it based on the spec that that i wanted and literally i i I do everything through that it's the 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 most amazing sounding thing um if you're a producer that definitely check out uta stuff because um they're 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 amazing do do you ever host writing camps um i've done it before i think it's great like to get everyone together and and to to have like people in different rooms and but the answer i guess now is is no i guess because of the way that i work i like i think they're good if they're if they work for people but for me i love for me like making music is is more of a sort of one-on-one or either i'm doing it on my own or if someone's coming in it's very like very few people I, i don't know like the where there's so many people in different rooms, it just doesn't doesn't work for me. And I'm not saying it does. I'm not saying it's not good. You know, if you, if you're, you know, a, a big pop artist and you're looking for, for songs, and you know, you can you can have all these different writers sort of bouncing off each other. But for me, it doesn't. It's more more kind of personal and more more intimate. So, no, I I I don't. Uh. How do you gain your consistency? And did you ever used to struggle? Each day I feel like a different producer. Um, how did you gain your consistency? And did you ever used to struggle? Each, um, I think the thing is with consistency is that it's it's honestly about showing up. Um, I can't remember who it was. A great, really famous writer just said that you, each day you have to show up at the page so so don't wait for inspiration to come to you but but you create the inspiration and i think that to me that the difference between someone that is doing it as a hobby whoa sorry about that um little uh droopy stand hang on what's going on with that um the difference between someone that's that's doing this for a hobby or uh Let's hope that stays up. Um, or professionally, is that the professionals go in when you don't feel like going in, or when it's like, like I do hear the 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 kind of you know I didn't feel inspired, and obviously there's going to be days that are great, and there's going to be days that are not, but I think that showing up each day is really important, and I've just made that habit and come sort of rain or shine with them feeling up or down. I think that the you know, if you're if you're feeling down, you can channel that into a song. Is is probably the best use of your use of your time. I think you can always do something. So the way I gained consistency was literally by being consistent. I think it's just turning up and you know, like a a runner, do you know, professional runner doing the miles. It's not like professional runners don't don't wait to see what the weather's like. I mean, they're just come whether it's dark or it's light. They just 
that you just get into that habit. Your body gets into that habit of, of doing it. So, um, and every day I feel like a different producer. Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes, sometimes I do feel like a different producer, but then I think you, you can, you can be diverse and you can try different things and you may, one day you may want to be listening to Afrobeat and, and working on that, seeing like how great that stuff is or the other day you may, you may be wanting to work on rock and I think that that it's like that diversity that eventually makes you unique um and and did you ever used to struggle I mean I still do so yeah and I think I always will I, I struggle with all sorts of things um imposter syndrome or uh just feeling like I there's a may come a point where I'm just playing the same chords or playing the same guitar or stuff or I Play, have the same beats or the same ideas and I think that that we talked about this before you know sometimes like removing yourself from from the studio at that point and maybe looking at it, trying to get inspiration from visual arts or, or watching a great film that that will stir something I think is is key but yeah definitely definitely struggle but I guess you can't let it beat you um would you recommend songwriters learn how to produce so we get more of a share of the masters? Um, I think that, I think it's always good to, it's always good to learn how to produce so you, as a songwriter, so you can present your demos and then if the demos turn into great songs, then then that's all, all power to you. A bit like me being a songwriter and a producer that, that learned to mix. You know, it wasn't necessarily because I wanted to become a mix engineer in my own right, because I always want to me mixing a record that I hadn't produced or or like had a part of didn't didn't really appeal to me. But but I think that's great. But I think if the if the the to get more share, more of a share of the masters. I mean, I see why you would do that, but I think that that feels to me like you would just be doing it for the money and maybe not the best way of doing things. I think that that it's good to learn to produce, but maybe for the right reasons. Um, but all power to to learning new things. You know, I think that's the 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 key, and then that could just take you in this new direction, which which could be great. Um, what's your take on upcoming writers and producers trying to get into sessions in these times? I mean, it's I, th I think these times are 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 challenging for everybody, but I guess this these these times have opened up the 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 fact that people can write songs on FaceTime or Zoom or so. I guess it's it's more empowering. I guess if if you're a new songwriter, because you could find someone, you could DM them, and they they'd be into your stuff, and you could say, well, why don't we just why don't we do a Zoom session tomorrow? And if it doesn't work out, the good thing is that you you're not you're not really invested in the way that you you haven't like driven up to Manchester to do the songwriting thing, and then you you find out you don't really get on, or you know it's it's quite empowering. You could say, well, why don't we just just hang out for half an hour on Zoom and see what kind of music we both like, and then play some chords or, or knock around some ideas. So, so I think it's, it, it, it's kind of an empowering time now from that, from that side. Um, why do you think so many are selling their publishing stroke masters to massive groups lately? Um, I think that the, the value on intellectual property and especially masters of songs is 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 very high at the minute and and it's hard to ignore that and i think that if songwriters are looking at at banking money up front rather than having it trickle through over the course of their their lives then then that's one way of looking at it i think that so that's probably why people are people are thinking. Well, actually, 
people want to take a check earlier on in their life rather than than the traditional retirement i mean there's some people that obviously view that as something that you shouldn't do and that it's your legacy and you should pass it down to your to your children and 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 always have those songs you know the the royalties within within your family which which i understand as well so i guess it's there is this this new trend that 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 people are kind of cashing in earlier but i guess it's like anything it's this it's 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 like in some ways your songs are your your you they are your legacy but i guess if if you can liquidate the asset at, at a certain time where it feels good in 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 the particular market and you you feel okay with that then then yeah that's that's what people are doing so um all power to 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 everyone i guess in in whatever they want to do um those questions are coming in we might not have time to answer them all but we will definitely follow them over to um move them over to next week um so just reading down i'm not i'm not like vetting the questions but there's a lot um when producing a song do you set out with a plan of attack or just experiment with trial and error until you find out what you like and and what it needs when producing a song do you set out with a plan of attack or just experiment i think it's a combination of the two i think for me setting out with a plan of attack at the beginning and then allowing yourself to stray out of that plan of attack is is key it's kind of like setting the the sat nav to to go to a certain destination but realizing that you may not just have to go down the motorway and you could take you know go off on the b road and you may find this restaurant that you love in a little country uh hamlet somewhere um i think that's the same with music you know just if if you have an idea of what you want to do i mean it, i do find sometimes that that younger younger producers and and younger artists that they, they, there's maybe like a a point where you don't want to say um what you really want to do what your intention is and i think you have to sometimes you have to get over that in a way that you that i see some people i used to do it all the time where you'd kind of noodle around and you'd lose time whereas i think the more time that the more songs that i've written and the more time i've spent in the studio with people it's cool to be like shot down, but to, to at least have an idea and to say like, why don't we do this or why don't we do that? And I think there's a way of doing it without being like domineering or, or sort of overpowering because then I, th and then I think you can, you can sort of respectfully or gracefully take a back seat and, and listen to someone else's ideas and take those on board. But I think it's, it's, it's good to have a plan of attack, but then yeah, to be open. I think sometimes if you, if you kind of pursue that, doggedly it it to me anyway it's like stifles the creativity a little bit so yeah that's that's the thing um i'm just gonna answer one more question and then then um for you guys around next week i'll be here six o'clock on tuesday um the last question is is there a new instrument you would like to learn or play um Is there a new instrument you would like to learn how to play? There's loads. I mean, I'm studying the keys now because it's, with synths, there's so many different textures with that that, that I'm forever exploring and I'm, I'm just loving some of these old synths that you, you can probably see here. But like, this is, an, this is an old memory Moog from the 80s, which I love. And that's a Juno, Roland Juno 106, which I've had for a long time and that if i can get this around is a is a moog voyager which is great so i'm just a bit obsessed i don't know you can be a bit obsessed you're totally obsessed um with old synth so that's that's the thing but um i love the sound of the cello i'd love to play the cello um i play guitar so i can play a bit of bass so that's good but um yeah some classical instruments would be good so I'd, I'd say cello yeah guys are going to leave it there but thanks again for for showing up here um, i appreciate your questions and and hopefully 
they help. Thank you for all your emails and your DMs and your your uh, your lovely messages that that you send me. Um, keep creating, and I'll see you next week, and we'll we'll answer those questions. Sorry, we can get through. It's because I waffle a lot on the on the answers, but hopefully that helps in some way as well. So have a great week. Stay safe.